I grew up in a large, dark, and damp cliché of what everyone pictures a haunted house would look like. For more than a hundred years, the house has loomed on top of a hill lined with foreboding oak trees where murders of crows would frequently stop. I have an older sister, seven years older, who was a problem child and very into the occult, demons, and devil worshipping, and she would terrify my younger brother and I with stories and just the general way she would look at us blankly. She wore black lipstick and dyed her hair black. When she turned about 13, she became even more rebellious, and she would run away and be missing for weeks and months. She was the one who originally introduced my brother and I to the Ouija board. My mother was an alcoholic, mentally ill, she was bipolar and was suicidal, in charge of watching us kids while my dad worked the night shifts and many times double shifts. To say our home had a bad energy would be an understatement. We would later learn the dark history of our home from the 90-year-old woman across the street. Mrs. Looker told us that our home was built as a home for unwed mothers, and so many births, deaths, and abortions, at the time this was very much frowned upon, happened there over the years. It served that purpose for about 20 years until it was forced to be shut down, and then was sold into a family who lived there until 1970, when my father bought it for an unbelievable price. He still lives there today. The first prefacing experience is the one that I only very vaguely remember, but my mom has told me in full detail many times, and my dad, who doesn't believe in ghosts, also corroborates. My mom was outside sunbathing, and my sister was inside with a friend of hers. I went into the kitchen and grabbed a butter knife and was holding it in a fist with a tip pointed to the ground, when I slowly walked into the living room and my sister was playing with her friend. I had a blank look on my face and was shaking and kept repeating that, Mommy needs help. She is fighting the devil across the street in a tunnel. My sister yelled for my mom and she came into the house and asked me what was wrong and I just kept repeating, Mommy needs help. She is fighting the devil across the street in a tunnel. My mom kept shaking me and telling me she was right here and to snap out of it. She said I was in that state for about an hour where I was just staring off into nowhere and finally I snapped back into reality and acting normal but didn't remember anything. My mom was convinced I was possessed. Later that night, when it was bath time, she noticed I had three bad burn marks on my shoulder and that she says looked like they were from the claws of a demon. It's also important to note that my mother was abandoned as a child and then adopted, and she has always been spiritual. She has experienced being saved by a guardian angel when she was young and found herself too far away from her rural house at nightfall and felt impending danger closing in on her. She can't explain what it was, but she knew she was in danger and scared. She closed her eyes and opened them, and she was all of a sudden on her front porch which was hundreds of yards away from where she was. So the next experience was from my younger brother's perspective. He is younger by a year and a half, and we shared a bedroom and bunk beds until I was 11. I slept on the top bunk and he was on the bottom bunk. Our room was always extremely messy with toys scattered all over the place. One morning, about 4 a.m., my brother woke up and said he saw mom crouch down cleaning up the toys. He only saw her back and her hair, which was a mix of gray and dyed blonde. My mother always wore a long light blue flowing nightgown to bed which was easily recognizable. He didn't think anything of it and went right back to sleep. In the morning when we woke up, the room was spotlessly clean and I asked him how that happened. He explained that he saw mom in there cleaning the room in the middle of the night. At breakfast, we asked her why she cleaned our room, and needless to say, she told us she had never been in our room that night. She went in to look and was amazed at how clean our room was since it was never like that. Around this time, my brother started getting frequent night terrors that would scare the living crap out of me. I'd wake up to him screaming, standing in the corner of the room facing the well and banging his head off the wall. Sometimes he would be saying, I'm sorry God, over and over. Sometimes he would be sitting in the middle of the room with his knees to his chest, hands draped around his knees, rocking back and forth, saying things that didn't make sense while bawling his eyes out. My dad would come down the long, dark hallway to our room and try to snap him out of it. Sometimes he would slap him hard to see if he would get a reaction, but his demeanor wouldn't change. Eventually, my dad said to just leave him be because nothing seemed to be snapping him out of it. And if you can imagine, this was terribly scary as a child. I'd wake up in a living nightmare, scared out of my mind having to watch him do this for sometimes an hour straight 
until he would climb back into bed and fall asleep. I remember one particularly scary episode when I woke up and he was sitting on the dresser Indian style with his back to the mirror, covering his eyes and crying, just saying, No, I won't. You can't make me look. I would try talking to him and sometimes he would respond but with simple answers. I'd grab him by the hand and told him we should get some water. He got off the dresser and followed me to the bathroom but refused to go in. I went in and turned the faucet on so he could drink out of it but he didn't want to go in the bathroom because the mirror was above the sink. I finally pushed him and he looked at himself in the mirror and let out the loudest blood curdling scream and was so frightened at his own reflection that he passed out. This continued for years and would happen probably once every two or three months and always in the wee hours of the morning. When I finally moved out of that room down the long hallway to the big bedroom around age 11, it was almost more scary waking up down there, alone, hearing my brother's fits down the hall. A few more important details about this house that you'll need to know is that the electrical and plumbing systems were very old and never updated. As a result, Many lights would never work, including the most important one for me as a child, the light in the long dark hallway outside my room, which connected to my brother's room, sister's room, and the only bathroom, which was straight down the hallway. When my brother was having his fits, I'd open the door and reach my hand out to flick the light switch on, but it would rarely work. If I wanted to go check on him, I'd have to run down the hallway in the pitch dark, feeling the walls to get to his room. This was the worst. So many times I'd just be too scared and would stay in the room with my light on. Now the old plumbing and piping in the house meant that when you turn on a faucet, not only would it sometimes be rusty red colored water for a few seconds coming out, which would then turn into clear normal looking water, but there was a distinct whistle sound when it came out, which intensified with a stronger stream. Many times I'd wake up down the hallway hearing the whistle and the water on full blast in the bathroom. I'd have to sprint down the pitch dark hallway to flick on the bathroom light and shut off the faucet. Imagine that dread for a second. Not only do you have to sprint down the hallway toward the scary noise in the dark, but you'd think that anything could be in that bathroom when you would flick that light on. Then I'd have to sprint down the hallway again to my room. The worst part is after I would shut it off and get back to sleep, I'd wake up an hour later to the faucet on again. This happened intermittently for years. My dad always said it was just my brother doing it to scare me, but he always denied it. This would be a pretty elaborate hoax to pull for so many years. The last thing I want to preface before getting into the terrifying Ouija night regards one of my girlfriends in my adult years. I was dating a beautiful Venezuelan woman with long black hair. We dated for about a year before I learned of her childhood in Venezuela where she gained local notoriety as an incredibly powerful medium. Some days she claimed as many as 30 ghosts would try to communicate through her. It got so bad that her mother had to take her to Zimbabwe to a witch doctor who was renowned for being able to reverse or suppress the powers that mediums have when it gets too overwhelming for them. I know, I couldn't believe it either, but when I met her mother, she told me the whole thing and she cried while telling it. My girlfriend also showed me the scars on her ankles, knees, and wrists, tiny little slits that I never noticed before where the witch doctor cut her to drain some blood for the ceremony. How did this topic of her being a medium come up? We were staying at a friend's house for his annual party where we played drinking games, hit up his pool, do a bonfire, and then go gambling on horses. Everyone stayed in the house, but my girlfriend and I brought my new tent and blow up mattress and stayed in his backyard. It was a pretty rural area and his backyard adjoined to a big cornfield. In the morning, we were pillow talking, and I thought she was just trying to scare me when she said, Did you hear the little girl outside the tent last night? I played along and said, Yeah, that was creepy, right? She said that she circled around the tent a few times and then ran into the cornfield. The whole day, I didn't think anything of it because I thought we were just playfully trying to scare each other in the morning. Later that night, I told my friend Mark, who owns the house, that my girlfriend had heard a little girl hanging around her tent. His face went white and he said, Wait a minute, how do you know about the little girl? Are you serious? And I said, What are you talking about? There's some urban myth story on his street that a little girl who went missing decades ago in the cornfields sometimes comes out of them at night and he always thought it was bullcrap. 
This is when I asked my girlfriend if she was serious and did she actually hear a little girl and that's when she came clean with the whole medium backstory. She said after Zimbabwe her powers weren't as strong but she would still get periodic ghosts that would try and talk to her. After I corroborated her crazy childhood medium story with her mom, I brought her to my dad's house where I grew up so she could meet my dad and she could only stay in the house for a few minutes before she had to leave. She said the dread she felt in there was the most overwhelming sense of dread she had ever had in her life and she never wanted to return. So now, onto the Ouija board night. My brother is now 20 years old and I'm 22. My mom lives in a house in our small city's downtown area and my brother spends a lot of time there because she lets him drink and smoke there. He had been there with his girlfriend playing the Ouija board all night when I got there after a drinking night with my friends. The door was locked and I knocked. He came flying down the stairs and swooshed open the curtain to see me standing there. He had the literal look on his face like he had just seen a ghost. I've never seen him this scared. He just tells me to come inside and I wouldn't believe what was going on. He says he and his girlfriend have been playing the Ouija board and they have this very strong evil spirit who calls himself AZ that has been talking to him all night. He's AZ because he encompasses everything and is omnipresent, apparently. He said AZ has been spelling out, kill mom, and saying evil things about her all night. She was sleeping in the room next door through it all. AZ was very sexual and vulgar. My brother said that he had knocked down a crucifix off the wall and opened and closed the bathroom door just a few minutes before I got there. The hair on the back of my neck was standing up because I believed my brother and I felt the dread, but I didn't have proof that I saw with my own eyes. I watched them playing and the planchette was whipping around the board answering questions quickly. AZ fixated on me and started spelling out, brother. My brother asked if he wanted to talk to me and AZ said no. He asked if he liked me and AZ said no. I then asked my brother to tell him that I don't believe him and I need a sign. AZ spelled out die. He then asked if he was going to hurt me and AZ said no and then spelled out mom. At that point, I went into my mom's room to make sure she was okay, and she was. When I got in her room, I stubbed my toe and tripped a little bit. I came back out to the living room and told Dan that mom was okay. My brother commanded AZ to leave my mother alone. He said that I wanted to see a sign. AZ then spelled out, trip. I started to feel a little wave of energy coming over me as I was thinking, did he just see me trip? My brother asked him what he meant by trip and I told them that I had just stubbed my toe in my mom's room. Then I said, ask him if he could hear me, and then I started addressing him myself. AZ said he could hear me. I said if I write down a word on a piece of paper, would he be able to see it and spell it? He said maybe. I asked if he would do it, and he said no. So I started to verbally abuse him a little bit, calling him a coward, and that if he really wanted us to know he was real, he would do it. The planchette started flying around the board without stopping anywhere but eventually spelled out short. I asked if he wanted me to write short words and it replied yes. I went to the far other side of the apartment with a piece of paper and a pen and I wrote down S-E-A-C. I came back and my brother asked him if he saw what I wrote and to spell it. The planchette circled slowly around the board and landed on S, then slowly went to E and my heart raced as I almost started crying from emotion. Then it landed on X. My brother asked me if I wrote down sex, and I said no, and I started to shake. My brother cursed at AZ, calling him a pervert and telling him to quit playing around. The planchette promptly went to C, and I said, oh my god. And then the planchette slid off the board with a pretty strong force, and my mom's cat came running out of my mom's room to the living room, jumped on the couch, and scrambled across it, then crawled under the table. It was terrified of something. I have goosebumps every time I recount this. My brother got AZ back on the board and I proceeded to keep playing the spelling game, next with ocean, then cream, then three or four more words and each time I would go to a different room and make sure no one could see what I wrote except for me and I'd fold it up and put it in my pocket. Each time I came back to the living room AZ spelled out the words with ease and faster and faster. I left the house, told my brother to be safe, and went to my friend's house up the road because there was no way I'd be going back to my dad's that night. 
I can't really explain the feeling you get when you know without a doubt that they are real, other than you are just overwhelmed with every emotion at the same time. Make no mistake about it, folks. They do, without a doubt, exist. Last summer, a friend and I were playing video games at around 10 at night, and we were getting bored and wanted to do something exciting, go on an adventure of some sort. Now, I live in Roar Island, where there isn't much to do for teenagers. We'd usually get our parents to drop us into town, but it was too late for that, so I thought it might be a good idea to venture down to Wilton Castle, an old medieval castle that's now in ruin. It's said to be heavily haunted and dangerous, but... Due to our adventurous traits, we decided to go anyway. Quick history of Wilton Castle. The castle was built on land by a young man as a reward after he saved King Henry III from a bear attack whilst hunting in a woodland in rural England. And when the young man refused to give up his Catholic religion, the land was confiscated. A family by the name of Butler were granted the estates and were to remain owners of the estate until the arrival of Oliver Cromwell in 1649. Oliver Cromwell was said to have used the cells under the castle as interrogation and prisoner cells where him and his men butchered, mutilated, and destroyed innocent Catholics inside. The ghosts of prisoners are said to roam the forest near the grounds and in the chambers where they wander mutilated and bloodied. Following Cromwell's reign, the land was given to an officer in Cromwell's army who complained wolves were wreaking havoc in the district, who eventually sold it to the Alcock family the final owners of the castle. Apparently, one of the final duels in Ireland took place on the grounds during 1807, where William Alcock decided to duel his rival electorate candidate, and once childhood friend in which he ended up winning and shooting his friend through the heart. The guilt got to his head, and he eventually ended up in a mental asylum, another abandoned landmark near my home, only it's partly inhabited. There's a story told that a certain Harry Alcock died in 1840, and on the anniversary of his death, a ghostly carriage would come down the castle driveway, and his ghost has apparently been seen on the road surrounding the castle. Another story was of Captain Archibald Jacob, a magistrate during the 1798 rebellion, and also a tyrant and later murderer whom fell from his horse near the castle, is said to haunt the grounds although reports of an exorcism during the early 1900s was said to have taken place which may have removed his spirit. In March 1923, the castle was burnt to the ground by IRA arsonist while some of its owners were on vacation. Inside were two butlers and an apparent young aspiring actress. All three were killed in the flames and their ghosts have said to roam the inside, especially the actress who is said to stand on the balcony ready to jump which she hesitated to do on the night of the fire. Following this, the castle remained in ruin until recently where plans were made to turn part of it into a small hotel, but we wanted to visit whilst it was still empty and dead. My experience. It was only a five minute walk. We grabbed our two phones, which we made sure were fully charged. There's two sides into the castle, the driveway, which involves crossing a damaged bridge, or the forest, which says specifically not to enter. But of course, we did anyway and soon the castle was looming over our heads, the moonlight peeking in between the clouds. We took photos of the area and spent time exploring around, but unfortunately we were witnessing no supernatural activity. But something happened, something that I can't explain to this day. My friend was taking a photo of the chambers when all of a sudden his phone shut off and wouldn't turn back on, followed by the dead battery symbol even though seconds before it was almost full battery. As soon as I went down with him, our luck ran out, as mine did the same, only it went straight down to 15%. This was our cue to get out whilst we still had a light source. The battery wasn't right as it was going down every 20 seconds or so. We decided to stay calm as that would save us a lot of hassle, unlike they do in the movies. I decided the best thing to do would be to ring my mother, which I did, and told her to meet us at the end of the road as soon as she can. But unfortunately, after this call, the phone was dead, and we were in the midst of a supposedly haunted woodland in the middle of the night with no light. We grabbed onto each other, using communication in our hands as a way to help get out. Every creak or rustle made us jump, but we kept going. I had a terrifying feeling that I was being watched from every angle, 
and I swear I heard breathing a few times too, but somehow part of me felt protected, like something was protecting us or watching over us. After around five minutes that seemed like hours, we managed to make it onto the dirt road which eventually led to the main road. We took out our phones and they switched themselves on, and as soon as we got onto the road, the batteries were back to 75 and 80%, and also six missed calls from mum. I didn't know which was scarier, but oh my god, as soon as we got into the car and back to mum, it was the biggest relief I've ever felt in my life. As soon as we arrived back home, we stuck on two cheese pizzas and watched reruns of Seinfeld for the rest of the night. But wow, what an experience. This happened over 25 to 30 years ago when I was in middle school. We lived out on seven acres of pecan orchards surrounded by farm fields in a very rural area outside of a small town in coastal Alabama. The house sat right in the middle of the property and had a screened-in porch on the back. We had a couple of horses, several dogs, two cats, and some hamsters. The cats were mostly indoors, but they went out occasionally and sometimes didn't come back in till the next day. Mine was a little Russian blue named Misty, and I loved her dearly. I had saved up my allowance and birthday money and found a reputable breeder. She was such a tiny little kitten, but I raised her into a fierce blue lioness who had a wonderful sense of humor and limitless patience with the awkward little girl who called her friend and sister. We had a special bond. She did everything with me, slept on my pillow at night, helped me with homework, brought me lizard gifts. When she was at the house, we were inseparable. My parents were pretty lax with many things, so it wasn't uncommon for me to be laid up at night watching TV downstairs. This particular night, I was curled up in an armchair with a blanket watching some movie or another. The chair was angled towards the TV, but I had full view of the full glass back door screen porch and yard beyond. I remember feeling the hair on the back of my neck stand up a bit. I can't really describe it. It was like something was with me in the room and it drew my attention to the back door. Sitting there on the other side of the glass, watching me, was Misty. In that moment, it didn't strike me as odd that she would be there waiting to be let in, despite there being no way for her to enter the porch from outside. She pawed at the door a bit and meowed a silent meow, and I felt a sad peace come over me. As I started to stand from the chair, the peaceful feeling shattered, and the cat's body twisted and distorted, tearing apart not in a gruesome way, but more like smoke in the wind and her mouth opened wide in a scream I could not hear, and then just like that, she was gone. The porch was empty, nothing stood at the door. I stared, unsure of what had just happened. Then I crept forward and opened it, looking out all around the porch, no cat to be seen. I walked out into the dark, calling her name. Nothing. I went to the screen door. It was locked. I opened it and looked around the yard, calling her name a bit more, but... There was nothing out there except cold night air and the moon. I figured I must have just imagined it. It was some weird trick of the light, a reflection on the glass. I had just enough weirdness for one night though, so I crept upstairs to bed. We found her the next morning as we were leaving for school. There wasn't any blood, and not much damage done other than a cut on one foreleg. She looked like she had started towards the house, but then just laid down and went to sleep before she could get there. A car had hit her sometime in the night, and I think when her body couldn't make it, her spirit continued the journey. One last visit, one last goodbye to her favorite little girl. Something very weird happened to me in 2012, and I'm finally ready to talk about it. It happened in Rockwood Mansion in Delaware. My question is, can ghosts mess with digital technology? I was there for a wedding. I didn't know about its paranormal history. At the time, I was obsessed with photography and since then rarely used my camera. I got there early and photographed the entire place, especially a grandfather clock I was drawn to. When I came back downstairs, the owner asked me why I went past the velvet red rope. I was down, I didn't even notice it was there. She told me I shouldn't have done that and gave me a story of bad things happening up there. That night I copied, not moved, the photos to my usual places. I believe the 3-2-1 backup method. 
So I put the pictures on my laptop, phone, tablet, external hard drive, iCloud, and OneDrive. I showed them to my roommate and a few friends that night. About an hour later, every photo from beyond the velvet rope was gone from all those places, not even in the recycle bin. Two of those devices were in my safe overnight. It freaked me out hard because everything before and after the velvet rope were still intact. I told no one of the warning I received from the owner, so it wasn't a prank. I started getting bad dreams involving house servants. It passed a few months later. My mom loves going to garage yard sales. If she can get craft supplies and not too shabby furniture for less than what she would pay in store, she's a happy person for the day. She had come home with this huge brown box full of random things. She had got the box for $2 and took the things she wanted out of it and gave it to me. There were some books and notebooks that I thought were cool. Most of the box was junk. Half-used notebooks, CDs with scratches on the back, some old cookbooks from the 90s, but something was stuck to the corner of the box at the bottom. This box was easily two feet tall to give a bit of an image for you. I pulled the item from the corner. It seemed to be stuck there like it was glued on or something, and it was this weird little doll. I don't really know how to explain it because I had never come across something like this. This happened in 2007, and all I had for a phone back then was this fake razor from track phone, so it wasn't like I could just take a video and picture easily. Anyway, the doll was about three to four inches tall, and it looked like a little Mexican or native girl. I remember looking at it and feeling drawn to it, like I wanted to check out every little piece. It had a few necklaces around its neck with those cheap beads you can get at any department or craft store, and they were blue, red, and yellow. The hair was odd. It didn't feel like yarn, it almost felt human. It had two black braids on its head that were tied with yarn and it was wearing a little dress that was blue and red. It almost looked handmade. And the eyes were creepy. Just two black lines of thread equal distance apart on the fence, and the body was just round. The features were all added with the accessories like the dress and hair, but the actual doll was just a lump of this tough netting-like material. It was heavy for a tiny doll, but I thought it was cool and weird. I was into that kind of stuff. When I lifted the dress, I saw a long needle, about the length of the doll's body that was covered by the dress, held to the doll through the netting. I pulled the needle out, and it didn't have a hole for thread to go through at the top, so instead of adding it to mom's sewing kit, I just stuck it about halfway into the body of the doll and went to go get dinner. Now, I have no idea if the two things were connected, but the next three days I was so sick. I missed school for a week because I was just throwing up all day long every couple of hours. I hadn't gone anywhere or eaten anything unusual to a normal day, plus none of my family or friends were sick at the time. It came seemingly out of nowhere. Anything I ate I couldn't hold down and after throwing up stopped, I was so tired and run down I had to use all of my strength just to walk around the house. For about a year, I forgot the doll existed. Mom had stuffed it on a shelf in my room surrounded by other random things I thought were cool when life went on. I had met this girl at my high school who was into spirit communication and swore she could see spirits and auras. She and I became best friends over time and one day I had her over to my place after school. It was a normal day and she was telling my mom what kind of pizza she wanted as my parents were heading out to get pizza for everyone. After they left, she found the weird little doll and pulled it down from the shelf to show me. She asked how I got it and said it had some pretty bad vibes about it. According to her, It actually tingled to the touch for her and she didn't want to have it in her hands for long. I told her what had happened when I got it and she was instantly alert. My parents called to say that they were going to see a movie which meant we had the rest of the night to ourselves at the house. My friend suggested we get rid of the doll. It was full of negative energy and she seemed genuinely creeped out at the sight of it. I agreed and we took the doll out to my house's fire pit. I found some old matches and we tried to light it on fire but the thing wouldn't light. The dress seemed fireproof, but it was just cotton. We went back inside and found some paper and wrapped the doll in the paper. She lit the paper, and finally the doll had some flames on it. We threw it in the fire pit, and my friend got pretty serious. She told me I had to say out loud that I wanted the negative energy and spirit connected to the doll to leave this house and leave my family alone. I did. I had this weird power come over me, 
and my voice was stronger than I anticipated. The flames got bigger and things got weirder. Inside the house, we heard my alarm go off. My friend and I ran inside and found my light was turned off, and my alarm clock was blaring at 11 p.m. The rest of the house was lit up like we left it, so I turned on my light and quickly unplugged the alarm. I was turning around to leave when something else started beeping. I went back into my room. With my friend right behind me, we searched for whatever it was, scared out of our minds. Finally, after some digging, I found an old Tamagotchi that was beeping. It was so loud you could hear it from outside the house, and nothing I did could stop the noise. My friend grabbed the toy and started to step on it, but the beeping just got more distorted. After taking several turns to stomp on this old toy, it finally broke and the beeping stopped. We gathered up the glass and plastic pieces and walked back to the fire pit, where we were greeted with a smell that we couldn't get out of our noses. The hair on the doll was still burning, a slow flame that was oddly the only flame left. The rest of the doll had burned and we poked it with a stick to see the remains of a tiny dress. My friend went home and I hugged my parents extra tight that night when they got home and went to bed scared and unable to process what had happened. I then had a vivid dream with people standing in black cloaks around my fire pit with a little doll in the fire pit on fire and they were all chanting, bring her back, bring her back and I found myself in tears like someone had died and I had witnessed it. One of the cloaks turned to me and yelled at me to say bring her back three times and I did as told until the final time I woke up mid-sentence and realized it was morning. I went back out to the fire pit that morning to find nothing in it but those cheap colored beads and five rusty nails all grouped together like they were stuck or glued in a bundle. Over the next year my dad lost his job. My parents had to file chapter 13 so they wouldn't lose the house due to the credit card debt that they now couldn't pay. My mom's card was smashed after she hit a deer while driving home. I have no idea if we did it right, as we were just some creeped out 16 year olds, but that was one of the scariest moments of my life. Everything I have said in this post is true. Has anyone else dealt with some voodoo dolls or possessed anything? I'll never forget this experience. My boyfriend Jay, his stepdad owns a property with two older houses in a small village. They are side by side and share a yard. His parents don't live in either of them as the older of the two is completely dilapidated inside and not inhabitable, but they sometimes use the newer one, furnished, has electricity, and they use it for laundry. They have well water at their farmhouse where they do live so they prefer to use the washer and dryer hook up in town. They have always talked about fixing up the older house and renting it out, but Jay and I's current living situation isn't working for us, so his parents made us a deal where we could fix up the older house for them, and then we could stay there. So for convenience, Jay and I have been staying at the first house on the weekends while we work on the older place, and some unexplainable things have happened in the past weeks. Not to mention, I always thought the energy in the place to be a little off. I used to brush it off because the house is 90% empty most of the time and it's not really lived in, but now I'm convinced the weird vibrations are from another source. It all started a few weeks ago on a Friday morning when Jay and I were drinking coffee and watching a large group of kids get on the school bus in an empty parking lot adjacent from our house. We thought it was great that a bus stop is located so close to the house we will be moving into for when we have kids of our own. The piece is significant because when I took our dog for a walk a few minutes after the bus drove away, I distinctly heard a young voice yell, Hello? My dog's ears perked up and we both looked around. I was afraid one of the kids had somehow gotten left behind, but there wasn't a single person in sight, so I continued to walk. As soon as I took another step, as if they were watching me, I heard a more persistent, Hello? This gave me a chill. I still didn't see any kids around and besides, they all should have been on their way to school. The next week, we painted the attic of the house on a Friday and the following Sunday, Jay noticed a trail of paint droplets, the exact color we used, upstairs on the kitchen floor in the new house. There is no way that it could have been from us. We didn't bring any tools or paintbrushes over to the new house or anything else that could have been dripping paint. That evening when we were leaving to go back home, 
We were about to back out of the driveway when Jay realized that he had forgot to lock the front door. He left his driver's side door wide open as he was locking up the house. On his way back, we both watched his door slowly but firmly shut and latch. Note that we were stopped on a slanted part of the driveway so the door literally swung uphill. This makes me think the spirit is very lonely and doesn't like it when we leave. Another strange thing that happened, I'm not sure if it could be related or not, is our dog started limping last Saturday after laying on the couch for a while at the new house. I didn't think much of it. I checked out her paw, didn't see any marks, and I just assumed she had been laying on it funny and maybe it fell asleep. But the next morning it had swollen up to three times the size of her other paws. She couldn't walk on it at all and got around by hopping with her three good legs. I still have no idea what could have happened to her and she didn't leave my sight the whole day. We took her to the vet for an x-ray and she said it wasn't broken but she was stumped too. No snake or spider bite marks either. She gave her pills for swelling and it was back to normal in just one day. I heard of spirits leaving scratches and bruises on people. So if we're dealing with a younger spirit, maybe they played a little too rough with our dog. I have no idea. There are other minor details that could arguably be coincidence like things randomly falling over in other rooms, weird dreams when we slept there, and randomly getting sick when we first wake up. So, just last night, Jay took our dog for a walk and they were gone for a pretty long while. What happened pretty much confirms my theory that there is a child here. He said they started to take the usual route around the block, but when they got to the first corner, she triggered on something and started relentlessly pulling him straight ahead instead of turning. She's a pretty strong pit bull and was acting like it was urgent, so he just let her lead him on to see where she wanted to go. She ended up taking him to a cemetery not too far from the house, and we didn't even know that it existed. She dragged him into a specific grave and started rolling around on it. Jay said the dates on the headstone were 1992 to 94. After rolling around a bit, she got up, shook off, and casually walked back to the house. One night at my old apartment I used to live at, I was sitting in the living room watching TV with my dog who was laying near me on the floor. Suddenly Max started growling. It wasn't a really aggressive growl because when he did it, he didn't move one bit. He just growled for a second then stopped. When I looked at him, he was still laying down, so I ignored it thinking maybe he was sleeping because sometimes he did that while he slept. A few minutes into the show, Max's ears stood straight up. Then he started growling more aggressively, and this time he got up and walked towards the hallway. I looked towards the hallway wondering what the heck he was growling at, and then almost instantly he started barking like crazy. I got up and went to look down the hallway and didn't see anything. The room door was open as I left it and the bathroom door was closed, so I really didn't understand what he was barking at. I decided to go check the room to see if maybe something fell and he had heard it, but I didn't. As I'm walking down the hallway and get close to the room, Max stopped barking. At this point he was behind me, so I turned around and looked at him and said, Oh, now you're done barking? And called him to come to me. Max wouldn't budge though. I don't know what it was, but he wouldn't come into the hall and usually he follows me everywhere I go. So I started walking back towards him and as I'm about to say what's wrong, the bedroom door slammed shut and Max started barking aggressively again. Needless to say, I was freaked out because at the time in my mind, I knew absolutely nothing could have slammed that door as hard as it had slammed. I grabbed Max's leash and went for a long walk until my roommate got home from work. Once my roommate got back, we went into the room together and couldn't find anything that would have slammed the door. The windows were shut and locked as usual. The air wasn't on. Nothing fell towards the door. It was weird and creepy, and even though we couldn't find anything, my roommate believed me. Later that night, I asked her why she believed me so easily, and she said, Because when we first moved in, I put a bowl face up on the counter in the middle of the counter and when I walked away I heard what sounded like a dish being placed on a surface but ignored it. When I went back into a kitchen, into the kitchen a few minutes later, the bowl was face down in the middle of the kitchen on the floor. I never said anything though, until now. Needless to say, we moved.
I live in a small town in the country. There are more cows than people, and some of the buildings are really old. This happened when I was about 8 years old, and this is the first time I've brought myself to tell this story, and I only have the courage because I'm far away from the trees. I lived in a valley, and the woods surrounded our house on all sides. Now, my entire family has lived in these valleys and hills for generations, and there are countless stories of paranormal things happening to all of us. Several strange things have happened to me, but this is one of the most terrifying. So living in a small town in the middle of nowhere, there wasn't really anything to do other than hike. I loved hiking and would repeatedly walk in the woods for hours. There was an old story that my great-grandmother told me of a creature that lived in the woods and would stalk anyone who entered. As a kid, I thought, yeah right, it was probably just a trick of the trees or something. But this day I stayed out a little later than I intended to and it started getting dark. Turning back, I began to walk towards my house when I heard a noise behind me. It wasn't uncommon to see a chipmunk or bird, but when I turned around, there was nothing there. Shrugging it off, I continued, but the sounds got louder and louder. You could hear the leaves rustle and the branches snap behind me. I began to get scared. You always hear those stories of kids being kidnapped because they're alone, so I began to run. Not the smartest because I tripped over a branch and fell, skinning my knee pretty bad. Turning around quickly, I thought I was done for, but there was nothing behind me, just trees and leaves. It was dead quiet, even the wind wasn't rustling the leaves, and there wasn't a single bird singing. Feeling pretty silly, I got up, brushed myself off, and turned to walk the rest of the way home. When I saw it, to this day I don't know what it is, or what it was. It wasn't a bear, it wasn't a deer. I live in the country and I know what they look like. This thing was in the distance staring at me. It was covered in fur and had these piercing white eyes and would look like horns or antlers protruding from its head. It knew I saw it because it smiled and I swear all of its teeth were like sharp fangs. I instantly wanted to scream and run but when I looked into its eyes I was frozen. I couldn't even blink let alone scream. I could only stand there, dumbly, as it got closer and closer. The closer it got, the more bony it looked. Its limbs were long and it looked starved. It stank like rotting flesh and I felt like crying, but I couldn't. I honestly thought I was done for until it stopped. Its head tilted and it just looked at me, then turned and walked away. When it left, I could move again, and when I thought I could walk without falling, I ran home. I shut myself in my room and bawled my eyes out for hours. I didn't go back in the woods for years and even now I'm wary of it. I don't know what it is or why it was there, but I got the message loud and clear and stay away. That happened well over 10 years ago and really the only major experience I had in the woods until recently. Now growing up I've seen more strange things in the woods than I can count, but most of them aren't anything to be concerned with except Recently, something dark has been moving in the woods. It looks like a man sometimes, but will change its shape. It ducks in between trees and hides just on the edge of where the woods are. I thought it was crazy, but my close friends have seen it too. This thing seems to give off an evil feeling. One of my friends were pushed down a hill and swears that she saw this dark entity out of the corner of her eye when it happened. Another of my friends swears they heard laughter coming from the trees. This thing gives me the creeps. I'm not sure if this shadow man is the same creature that I saw, or it was a wendigo or something, but it definitely isn't friendly. Does anyone have any idea of what this thing is? Is it the wendigo, or are they two different entities? This happened in 2006 when my husband and I started dating. It was Christmas Eve and we had gone to the pub to celebrate with some friends. Almost as soon as we walked in the door, one of his friends approached him, looking agitated. She said she had something to show him outside, so the two of us followed her out. She took out her digital camera and showed us a photo. It was of three young women smiling, standing with their arms around each other's shoulders. To me, it didn't look anything out of the ordinary, but... I had just moved to town and I didn't know any of the women. My husband seemed puzzled too at first before his friend broke in. This was taken tonight. I watched the color literally drain out of his face. 
15 minutes ago in there, she said. They both started kind of freaking out, looking at the camera, then each other, then back at the camera. By this time I was super confused, so I asked what was going on. My husband explained that one of the women in the photo had died from cancer the year before. The other two were her sister and best friend. My husband's friend was really torn about showing the other women the photo, and together they decided not to. I thought this was the wrong decision, but I didn't really know any of them very well and didn't feel like it was my place to intervene. I later was introduced to the two women and can confirm that they were wearing the same clothes as in the photo and that the interior of the pub also matched. I don't know if the friend ever showed them or what happened to the photo, but I looked at it a number of times that night and that was sober as we had just arrived and I know that there was a third woman in that picture. So, I'm an alien geek. I like the idea of aliens and think it's cool to think of how big the universe is and all of that. However, I'm pretty skeptical that there are beings visiting us just to mess with our crops, mutilate some cattle, and probe us and peace out. I know that there are other reasons and theories behind visitations, but dang, why don't we have more concrete evidence? All that being said, I remain an alien geek enough that I took a two hour long detour while driving my family from Las Vegas to Salt Lake City to drive by Rachel, Nevada and see Area 51. We wanted to get some souvenirs at the little alien and head on our way. We were running late so by the time we got back on the highway 93 to head back up into Utah it was probably about 10 p.m. and super dark outside but the stars were bright because there is nothing out there. We were probably 60 miles from the last car we had seen in Rachel and that is when we saw something. The whole encounter probably took a minute and a half. First I saw a horizontal arc or a semicircle of about 12 lights that flashed on and were brighter than anything else in the sky. When I saw them, I just yelled at my wife, What am I looking at? She just gasped and questioned further. The semicircle sequentially blinked off after a few seconds and we were left questioning. It was below the scattered clouds and I started guessing as to what it could have been. Maybe airplane flares, but they didn't seem to be moving. Of course, being the hopeful skeptic that I am, my eyes are glued to the sky. About 20 seconds later, I see something darkening the clouds in front of us, like I could see it swoop in front of the stars. That is when the same brightness dozen or so lights turned on in a clear triangle shape and a few seconds later another grouping of lights blinked on next to the triangle creating a diamond. The diamond shape was not connected to the triangle and it seemed to be static since it was shining through a light cloud. Mind you, these second lights were clearly surrounded by a cloud but they were not dimmed at all by the cloud. Both shapes were perfectly symmetrical and seemingly facing us the only people within 50 miles. These lights tracked with us for about 15 seconds and I yelled at my wife to grab the phone for a camera. Almost the instant she brings up her camera the lights go out. We see another flash far above the clouds a few seconds later but they are gone. My question is, what on earth did I see in the middle of the Nevada desert two days ago? Dozens of high altitude, well above cloud level drones? Is that a thing? What kind of aircraft makes geometric shapes and intensely bright light formations? Government testing of aircraft in the middle of the night just to mess with travelers? If it was a single aircraft, it was massive since it was mingled with the clouds when it made the diamond formation. I just had to write this all down because my wife is getting tired of me geeking out about this for the past 48 hours. Hey friends, thanks for listening. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community. Be sure to check out my Choose Your Own Path horror game on the iOS and Android App Store, and grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.